Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is about what modern research tells us about the route Mallory and Irvin might have taken. The two routes that Mallory himself said he had as options were a route to the east of the Coolwar, which I will refer to as the zigzag route, and a route crossing the Coolwar and climbing out the other side, which I will refer to as either the Coolwar route or the small gully route, as it would exit the small gully from the main Coolwar. For both the zigzag and the Coolwar, there is no one single way to climb that particular route, but rather several viable alternatives, with the optimal route largely dependent on the amount of snow. This video will look at what modern research tells us about the possible routes. I use the term modern research to refer both to the new information that has come to light in recent years and also the approach of using photographs, geographic information systems, and climbing statistics rather than eyewitness accounts from climbers who spent very little time at or near the terrain in question and were suffering from exhaustion and even hallucinations during that period. Another part of modern research is that the number of different accounts now available from the original climbers has greatly increased. Over their lifetimes, the participants, people like Norton and Odell, gave numerous different accounts. Not surprisingly, some of these accounts differ from each other, and charlatans are quick to jump on the statements that agree with their theory and pretend the versions that disagree do not exist. For instance, if you want a quote that Norton felt the zigzag route was climbable, there is a quote for that. If you want Norton saying the zigzag route is impossible, there is a quote for that. They are from 17 years apart, but pick whichever one you want. If you want Odell saying Mallory and Irvin were at the final pyramid, there is a quote for that. If you want a photo of Odell pointing at the warts along with a statement from a guy who heard from a guy that the question being asked was where Mallory and Irvin were last seen, then you can use that as well. As a follow-up to this photo, some of the snow monkeys over in the Yeti Academy have been looking into its validity. The original story goes that the photo was taken by Leo Dickinson when Odell was asked where Mallory and Irvin were last seen. Leo Dickinson is a famous mountain cinematographer who flew a balloon over Everest in 1991. The first problem is that this story is told to us by Conrad Anker, who in the same presentation says the cooker rolled down from Camp 5 when in fact it did not, and he states Mallory and Irvin didn't have sunscreen, even though there is a video of members of the 1999 team sniffing the tube of zinc oxide they found on Mallory's body. Tom Pollard has stated the photo was taken by Bradford Washburn, a famous mountain photographer and researcher. Going beyond the obvious problems, the Snow Monkey's initial research shows us that Mr. Washburn likely never met Odell, and so far no evidence of this meeting has been found. The photo was allegedly taken sometime in the early 1980s. Bradford Washburn has passed away, but his archivist presents the real possibility that he never met Odell. Leo Dickinson is still alive, but this photo is not from any of his, his published sources, and he has not published work about Mallory and Irvin, his work being ballooning over Everest and skydiving around Everest, including a world record attempt. So it is not clear who even took this photo, nor what question was being asked of Odell at the time. I do not think this is a photo of Odell pointing to where he saw Mallory and Irvin, because it contradicts Odell's diary entry at the time, his dispatch to Norton, also written shortly after the sighting, and his numerous statements about that sighting in the years after the expedition. It was also never written about in any publication. This version is purely a creation of the internet from a presentation that offers numerous demonstrably false statements. I will point out that one mystery is exactly how high Odell went looking for Mallory and Irvin with Odell stating simply that it was somewhere between 27,000 and 28,000 feet. A perfectly legitimate question to have asked Odell is to point where he personally climbed up to looking for them. The location he is pointing to would match with it being between 27,000 and 28,000 feet, and that location would be one Odell would likely go to to search for them. From there, he would have a pretty good view of the mountain in front of him, and he could see that they were not there. If Odell was being questioned by a legitimate research, such a person would not likely ask him for the umpteenth time the exact same question he had been asked so many times in the past. A legitimate researcher would know that his memory had likely not improved in the decades since his original sighting, and Odell had access to photographs of the mountain previously, and they did not assist him in recalling exactly what he saw. Instead, a legitimate researcher would ask for a clarification about an issue that is not known and might add a little information about the entire expedition. Now, I have no idea if that was asked, just as everyone else has no idea if he indeed was asked for the umpteenth time where they were last seen. A legitimate researcher would also have immediately spotted the problem if Odell was indeed asked where they were last seen and would follow up and clarify with Odell at that time. He or she would also take notes or have a recording of the interview. 
And in the case of legitimate researchers, such as Bradford Washburn, these items would be stored in an archive somewhere. Currently, the snow monkeys are working with the archive to uncover any such information, but so far have turned up empty pod. Hopefully, the snow monkeys can get to the bottom of this great mystery. And that is another aspect of modern research. Statements made on the internet are being checked by everyday people, and the wealth of information about even moderately famous people allows us to debunk or at least highly question various statements that have been repeated over and over until people have accepted them as true. Another aspect of modern research is that various statements from modern climbers who have commented on this issue are also easily available on the internet. I discount the statements from great climbers like Conrad Anker and Reinhold Messner because they have changed their minds on this issue. And that change always seems to correspond to a book being written or a movie being made. For instance, Conrad Anker changed his mind about the second step being climbable four times. And in his book about Mallory, Messner concludes that the small gully out the Clouar was not climbable by Mallory nor anyone else using similar equipment. And yet years later in an interview, Messner states 1924 climbers could have climbed out the Clouar. Uh, Odell and uh, Mallory uh, go traversing, going into the Clouar, Maybe, maybe they had a chance, but not on, the, not on the ridge. In terms of Mallory's choice of routes, much of the modern research is not really new. It has been known about for years, but largely ignored. To start with, there are Mallory's letters to Marjorie Holmes, written in 1923 and 1924. Mallory wrote a postcard to Holmes that explicitly stated the Northeast Ridge route was impossible. It is not clear exactly when this postcard was written, but it was sometime after March 1923. The next clue we have about Mallory's routes are his statements he made to John Knoll, the expedition photographer. In the 1927 book, Through Tibet to Everest, John Knoll wrote, Mallory told me himself when he talked to me of his possible routes up the final pyramid and told me where to watch for him that he expected to go up the northeast ridge of the final pyramid, but if he found the gully particularly difficult or if the west wind were particularly bad, he would take the eastern ridge, missing the gully and passing across the head of it and gaining better protection from the west wind. Such a route would bring him along the knife edge of the eastern ridge. This route is corniced by the continual action of the west wind. Now at that time, the exact orientation of the ridges was not known. Thus, the eastern ridge is really referring to the northeast ridge. From this description, Mallory had two intended routes, to enter the gully or to pass across the head of the gully. Here, the word gully simply means the Norton Coolwar, although it was obviously not called that at the time. The two routes had to be close enough together such that one could attempt the gully first, and if it was too difficult, turn back and take the other route. Even assuming this means just that he would be able to get a good look at the couloir to determine the snow conditions, he would still have to get close enough to make that determination. If the couloir was too difficult, or even looked too difficult, Mallory could not realistically backtrack over 300 meters to the base of the second step and then try to find a way up. Whatever his backup route was that passed across the top of the couloir, it did not involve going all the way back to the second step. It thus had to have been had an entry point somewhere close to the couloir, where one could have already entered the couloir, turned back, and still have enough time, or at least get close enough to have a good look at the couloir and its conditions. Norton describes such a route to Rutledge. Norton has suggested the possibility of breaking through the lower of these two bands east of the Great Couloir and traversing along the slabs between it and the upper bands until it is possible to break through the latter. So I'm going to look at the two routes Mallory mentioned, referring to this one as the zigzag and this one as the Couloir, though there are different variations of each one. The comparison is between two viable but difficult routes. In either case, this makes up the crux of the climb. The routes can best be understood by the 1922 photograph taken from the high point of Mallory, Norton, and Somerville, just below 27,000 feet. The photo was taken by Somerville with his now famous VPK. Mallory wrote about his potential routes to the summit, specifically mentioning this photograph. Somerville's photographs will convey more to the trained eye of the mountaineer than any words of mine, and it will readily be understood that there is no question for us of gymnastic struggles and strong arm pulls, wedging ourselves in cracks and hanging on our fingertips. We should soon have been turned back by difficulties of that sort. We could allow ourselves nothing in the nature of a violent struggle. The photograph was taken at 2.15 p.m., and Mallory writes about his calculations at the time. They were that they were making just under 400 vertical feet per hour and getting slower as they ascended. Thus, if they continued, it would be nightfall before they reached the summit, which was over 2,000 vertical feet away. Mallory writes that the three of them agreed with these computation and, quote, were prepared to leave it to braver men to climb Mount Everest by night. 
Mallory also writes about how one of his feet was getting cold due to wearing too many socks and thus restricting his circulation. Norton rubs his foot warm, Mallory takes off one of his socks, and reports the foot is fine the rest of the way. Mallory notes they were not completely exhausted, but turned around because it was the safe thing to do. He notes they could have climbed up to the northeast shoulder some 400 feet above in about two hours. Thus, Mallory knew full well about the diminishing climb rate at altitude, and his two-hour estimate is approximately how long it took the 1933 team to make a similar distance. However, Mallory notes he had no strong interest in getting to the northeast shoulder and was happy to turn around as there was no prospect of making the summit. So at 27,000 feet in 1922, without oxygen, Mallory is able to think straight and has no major problems with his gear. His clothing is adequate and his assessment of climb times is realistic and he is making just under 400 vertical feet per hour without oxygen, significantly faster than Conrad Anker's climb rate in 1999 of 283 vertical feet per hour at the same altitude but using oxygen and fixed ropes. Mallory accurately sums up the issue with a route to the summit. It was our intention naturally in setting out this day to reach the summit of Mount Everest, provided we were not stopped by a mountaineering difficulty, and that was unlikely. The fate of our expedition would depend on the two factors, time and speed. Thus, when standing in this spot and seeing this view, Mallory saw some route to the summit that he did not view as difficult. As modern researchers would rediscover almost 100 years later, the key to making the summit was time and speed, and not the ability to climb an obstacle that Mallory clearly saw and wanted nothing to do with. Mallory notes taking time to enjoy the view and having some chocolate, mint cakes, or acid drops, but an acid drop is just a British term for a sour, hard candy. Mallory reports having some brandy when an anonymous member of the three-person team produced a flask he had been carrying. So Mallory assures us this is non-alcoholic type of brandy. Looking at the photo, there's a small gully exit to the right of the bulge. Later, Norton and Smythe will debate how to deal with this bulge in the wall of the couloir, which they call a buttress. Norton wants to cross over the top, and Smythe wants to go underneath it. Neither Norton nor Smythe actually get past the obstacle, and all of Norton and Smythe's proposed routes remain unclimbed to this day. The variations of the zigzag route are visible, with the bands being the strata Norton was referring to. Mallory would have to zigzag through those to reach the snow slope above. It might be possible to climb out the gully and then cross over to the third step, as that route has been descended by various snowboarders, including Marco Sofredi. However, that would turn the entire upper climb into snow and ice climb, which makes perfect sense with modern front point crampons, but in 1924 it was much easier to climb on rock with hobnail boots as even Smythe states that you could climb out on the rocks next to the small gully to get around being exhausted from cutting so many steps. However, it is much easier to avoid cutting steps by picking a rock route rather than an ice route, and it is unlikely a 1924 climber would climb up an ice route only to traverse over to another ice route. As a note, although the snow slope at the base of the first step is clearly visible in this photo, this photo was taken roughly 1,000 feet above where Odell reported his sighting and further to the east. In fact, it is above Mallory's Camp 6 in 1924, so this is definitely not the view Odell had at 1250. Turning to the zigzag route, numerous photos of it exist, and I'll link to some more in the description. Ultimately, for photos taken above 8,000 meters, they all look similar to this one. Photos taken from base camp are significantly distort the angle, and you should look at known obstacles to determine if the photograph either understates or overstates the slope. For instance, in this photograph, the zigzag route looks fairly steep, but so does the first step. Thus, the photograph overstates the slope. Fortunately, modern geographic information systems provide information about the slopes of the two routes. For this, I'll use Google Earth Pro, as with this particular data set, it matches up with known altitudes pretty well. Google Earth is not exact, but it can give us an idea of the nature of the slope in a given area and is just another tool that will be used to compare these two routes. For the zigzag, there is a vertical ascent of 178 vertical feet over 474 horizontal feet. But even in just looking at the steep part, that is 131 vertical feet over 300 horizontal feet. A little trigonometry tells us that averages just 24 degrees of slope. The cool route is longer, but it has a similar altitude gain, 314 vertical feet over 1,083 horizontal feet for an average slope of just 16 degrees. Looking at the steep part of the Kula route, this gives 176 over 3, 483 with an average slope of 20 degrees. 
Of course, the average slope does not capture the relative difficulty, but you can see in Google Earth, Earth that the max slope along the Kuar route is 86%, which is a slope of about 41 degrees, and the zigzag has just slightly less of a max slope. Comparing this to the general area of the second step, that has a rise of about 100 vertical feet and 150 horizontal feet for an average slope of 59 degrees. And while I would not base the entire analysis on measurements from Google Earth, these match up with photos of those routes and confirm that the second step would be significantly more difficult than either of Mallory's two possible routes. Most likely, that is why Mallory chose to focus on these routes. It also shows that the Kuar route would be the less steep of the two, but a typical mountain climbing technique is to zigzag up steeper sections, thus decreasing the actual angle you need to ascend. This is an obvious possibility for the zigzag route, but not so with the Kuar, which requires a fairly straight up attack. For reference, from high camp to the summit is a straight line distance of 1.15 miles, or 6,072 feet, with an elevation gain of 2,330 vertical feet. This comes to an average slope of 21 degrees. Using the same analysis, you can see what happened in the Norton and Smythe climbs. Norton's route from high camp to his high point has an average slope of 17.8 degrees. From his high point to the summit has an average slope of 28 degrees. For Smythe, the difference is greater as he faced the same 28 degrees as they reached approximately the same high point. However, after climbing just four hours, he had reached the same high point as Norton, but having left from high camp, his vertical ascent totaled only 726 feet. With a horizontal distance of 3,430 feet, or 0.65 miles, this gives it an average slope for Smythe's climb of just 12 degrees. So Smythe and Norton were able to climb fairly well without oxygen on average slopes of just 12 and 18 degrees respectively. But beyond their high point, the slope was significantly steeper not just in that one particular section of the route, but the route was going to be more than twice as steep as Smythe's earlier route the entire rest of the way to the summit. It is not that Norton and Smythe experienced a single rock or obstacle that prevented their ascent. It was that the final summit pyramid is much steeper than the rest of the mountain, and being completely exhausted from climbing without oxygen on relatively mild slopes, they had no hope of making a 28-degree climb to the summit without oxygen, even if it was a nice, even snow slope the entire way. While the zigzag and Kuro routes would still be the crux of the climb, it is not the case that simply getting past them means an easy route to the summit. The slope above these routes is barely less than the slopes of these routes themselves, while there is and while there is limited to no information about people climbing Mallory's intended routes, there's plenty of information about people climbing the steep slopes above those two routes. And inexperienced climbers reach the summit climbing those same routes above the third step all the time. There is nothing in the data or the photos that shows the zigzag or Kuar routes presented anything significantly different from the various routes up the final pyramid. And this is simply not the case for other fantasy routes. For instance, having Mallory and Irvin bypass the second step to the south, for that route, both the photos and geographic data show it would be impossible for Mallory and Irvin. A major advantage to these satellite photos and the geographic information associated with them is that they allow you to better understand various routes. For instance, this photo of the Australia 1984 climb shows the route Tim McCartney Snapes led out of the Coolwar. It is the solid line, the dashed line being the descent. Looking at this photo, that route looks next to impossible. But looking at the satellite photo, you can see the line, and it gives some indication that a great climber like McCartney Snapes can intuitively find such a line when it looks impossible to everyone else. And while we're at it on the Australian climb, I'll zoom in on this photo from Lincoln Hall as it shows the zigzag route covered in snow. And while it would be easy to climb with this much snow, and Mallory did not have anywhere near that level, you can see how one would zigzag through the route. The only question is, was Mallory the level of climber who would have been able to spot such a route when the snow didn't make it obvious. Of the two possible routes Mallory was considering, Somerville's 1922 photo, which Mallory commented on, shows the zigzag route looks climbable. Modern photos of the zigzag show it is climbable, and the data from Google Earth shows it is a steep slope, but nothing so steep as to be unpassable. At this point, it really should not be a mystery as to which route they took. However, despite Mallory having said he was going to climb one of these two routes, this does not stop charlatans from coming up with new and inventive theories. 
A recent theory is that Mallory's group of Sherpas took up some extra sleeping bags from North Cole, and this meant Mallory intended to sleep in the open above High Camp, and somehow this also implied he wished to climb the second step. First, back at North Cole, Norton had just told Mallory that the entire contents of his thermos emptied into his sleeping bag. As it never gets above freezing in High Camp, this would mean Norton's sleeping bag was ruined, and Mallory would likely have taken up a replacement. He could also use one of the Sherpa sleeping bags as uh, after they had headed down the mountain. Thus, taking sleeping bags up from North Cole means nothing more than that Mallory didn't want to sleep with a block of ice in his sleeping bag. Odell later used the sleeping bags left in Camp 6 to make his signals and did not say anything about one being full of ice, so likely Mallory replaced Norton's bag and either a Sherpa carried it down or the frozen bag was simply thrown off the cliff. However, there is no possibility that Mallory had any plans to sleep on the upper mountain because on the night of June 7th, his note to Odell reads, Be sure of getting back to 4 tomorrow in time to evacuate before dark, as I hope to. It is also unlikely Mallory changed his mind about this later because had he intended to spend the night on the mountain, he would have left a note for Odell to stay in high camp and prepare hot water for Mallory and Irvin's return after spending the night on the mountain. It is no mystery what routes Mallory intended to climb because he said what his route choice was and he explained numerous times why he would not climb the difficult obstacles along the ridge. It is no mystery that he did not intend to sleep on the mountain with just a sleeping bag because the last dispatch from him says he plans on being back to North Cole before dark. The only mystery is why some people are so stuck on one idea that they think every detail is proof they took the ridge while ignoring the obvious evidence to the contrary. But whether this is just a case of art imitating life will be the subject of my next video.